Welcome to Tales from the Waystone, a King Killer Chronicle reread podcast. We are your hosts, Will and Phoenix. Let's get into it. So today we're doing things a little bit differently. It's a bonus episode about Neil Gaiman's Fortunately the Milk. Now you may be asking yourself, hey, Will and Phoenix, where are you guys doing a bonus podcast? I thought we were reading Name of the Wind. And we're here to answer that question. So a little while ago, the hard drive that contains all of our master audio got dropped. Approximately eight inches onto a floor, and it is broken now. Unfortunately, the audio for episode nine was only on that hard drive. Luckily for us, we did have episodes one through eight saved to our hosting service, so we didn't lose those episodes, but nine was a complete wash. We continued on and recorded episodes 10 through 12, but because I have to edit things, and it takes a little while to edit a full episode, we decided that we're going to do a couple of little bonus pods that are a little shorter and a little more fun because we're also in the middle of a tough section of The Name of the Wind. Episodes 9, 10, and 11 are going to be a little tough, so might as well go for a fun little book by one of our favorite authors. Fortunately, The Milk is a fun little romp, I think romp is the correct word, that is meant for all ages and is just delightfully silly and also contains beautiful illustrations by Scotty Young, who is a wonderful comic artist and one of our favorites. And of course, it includes Neil Gaiman's ever droll narrative voice, which if you ever listen to his actual speaking voice, I could listen to him read the, <laughs> read the phone book and it would be enchanting. Hey, you stole that from me. I'm the one who keeps saying that. Also, Neil Gaiman does a lot of his own audiobooks, just FYI completely worth picking up if you haven't heard him speak or if you have heard him speak it's just worth picking up i would also heartily recommend this for any people who have little ones that they want to read a fun bedtime story this would be right up your alley and right up theirs it really is worth getting a physical copy this is one of the few neil gaiman books that i would say you have to get the physical copy of yeah, he does fun things with not only illustration, but also typography. Certain sentences are in a more cartoonish font. And style and shape. It all lends itself to a little madcap narrative. Little point of order. This episode will be a little bit different as well next week's episode. We are forgoing the recap. There's no need for a punishment on a bonus pod. We are also not going to be doing an interesting fact for these particular episodes because, once again, no punishments on a bonus episode. It's too much fun to win. Or you just find it too achy to have another cherry. Yes, and? And? Anywho. (laughs) We will also not be doing our seven words from real life, but we will have our seven words from the book. Because this podcast naturally assumes that you either don't care about spoilers or that you have read the material that we are going to be talking about. If you have not read Fortunately the Milk, please do so before you listen to this or just agree not to get mad at us for spoiling the entire book. Spoilers ahoy! Like chips ahoy? Yes, exactly like that. It's a cookie made out of spoiler chips. We start with our framing device, which is two kids and their dad, with mom going out of town. She is a famous herpetologist, and she's delivering a paper on lizards. She's going to be gone for a week, so that means dad is in charge. What I love is that while dad is reading the paper, she's telling him all of the instructions for how to take care of the kids, as if he wasn't a competent person who could make sure his kids are alive at the end of this trip. And of course, he recites back all of the things that he needs to do perfectly. This version of dad sitting there reading the paper, when I was growing up, that's something that I associated with being an adult. And so when I was old enough to start wanting to appear older, 
I made a point of reading the newspaper with my breakfast. Now granted, it was usually just the comics, but it made me feel adult to be reading it out of a newspaper. Also at the time, the newspaper really was the only option. You know, I'd sit back, I'd put the paper up, and just kind of sit there and look pensive, just like my dad used to. Did your parents ever notice the pensive look? I don't think so. They couldn't see me on account of the newspaper up in front of my face. <laughs> Again, mostly it was either the comics or the sports page. Gotcha. I was a grown-up at age 10. I also love that it calls out so well that mom did all of these things in preparation so that it would make his life easier. She made meals for every day that she would be gone, which is not an insignificant amount of work when you consider that there are three people she's cooking for and gets a list of everything that needs to be done, including feeding the fish, taking care of the kids, making sure that they get to orchestra practice, violin practice, and then reminds him at the end, right before she leaves, and we're almost out of milk. This will prove important. So then the first night, they attempt to make one of the meals that she's pre-prepared for them and already frozen for them, and it doesn't go so well, so they end up going out for Indian food, which that's something we've got some experience with. Absolutely. Another one of those things about wanting to appear adult is that we have made efforts in the past to make food at home, have leftovers, all that wonderfulness. Yeah, I remember one time that I made a curry in the crock pot and it had pineapple in it. Pro tip, pineapple does not microwave well or freeze well. It's disgusting. Yeah, I remember the two of us taking little bites of it and just not wanting to be the ungrateful one, just kind of grinning and burying it until we looked at each other and could both see the same kind of look of disgust as we were painfully gulping this down. And then finally I go, do you want to just get a pizza? <laughs> and it was like, thank God, you just threw away the leftovers. Oh, thank God you said so. <laughs> That was that was ill-fated because I remember being really excited for those leftovers because the first night had been so tasty when we had them. But man, the freezer and the microwave did a number on them and oh, never again. So they go out for Indian, which, I mean, that's just delightful. And then dad makes some hot chocolate to help ease the pain of mom being gone. Which I think is really sweet. Yeah. And... Of course, he uses the last of the milk. So in the morning, kids wake up well before their dad and find out that there is no more milk for their cereal. The thing that actually seems to spur the dad to go and get milk is that he no longer has any milk for his tea. His no tea face actually is what makes him forgo the options of just getting something that doesn't need milk for breakfast, like sausage and eggs or something. There is something that is mentioned about how the little boy thinks to himself that he could put orange juice on his cereal. So I know that you have a story about this. Yes. So when I was in college, the campus cafeteria, you could get whatever you wanted for breakfast in there. And they had a milk fountain and a juice fountain right next to each other. And my normal morning breakfast on days when they didn't have anything hot out, it'd be a bowl of cereal with some milk on it and then a glass of orange juice. And I was particularly groggy that one morning and without thinking just put my cereal bowl under the juice fountain instead of the milk fountain and then got myself some orange juice on my frosted mini wheats. It was not good. Now I've heard tale of other people putting weird substances on their cereal. For instance the author John Green has told this very often, he prefers putting water on his cereal, and I don't get it. At that point, I would just not hydrate my cereal. Yeah, that's gross. My grandfather used to put blue cheese dressing on his cereal. His logic being, well, it's basically milk. Ew. <laughs> You've met my grandfather. I think he lost his taste buds in the depression, and I also think that he delighted in grossing out his kids. His kids are the ones who told me about it. So wait, this happened 
not in front of you, but like in front of your aunts and your dad. Yep. <laughs> oh, your grandfather is delightful, though. He is. He always is going for ever more avant-garde flavor profiles just so that he can taste something again. Wasn't there a time that he did something that really bothered your mother? Yeah. My mom had gotten these nice fancy biscottis and then had also gone to the trouble of making some good pimento cheese. And my grandfather just decided, well, these cookies are good. And this pimento cheese is good, and so then he started dunking the biscotti and the pimento cheese and then eating it. That story still gets pulled out. He still maintains that it was a good idea. About that. That sounds gross. There was a time when he just went for super hot hot sauce, and then after he started having really bad heartburn problems, and his stomach no longer agreed with tomato-based things or pepper-based things, he started looking for savories that would do it. It's a long, strange trip. All right, back to the story. Yes. Dad agrees to go get some milk for the kids. And then it takes forever. I don't know if you remember how much longer it seemed for everything to take when you were a kid. But especially when you're sitting there hungry, looking at your cereal... You take a bite of it, it has no milk on it. When you're a kid, two hours seems like it takes forever. As an adult, two hours flies by. (laughs) Unless, that is, you are distinctly not having fun. This is true. It can still feel like an eternity. Anyway, back to the story. So then, Dad finally gets back after what seems like ages and ages. And he brings with him the milk. And the little boy says, you ran into one of your friends and started talking and lost track of the time, didn't you? I mean, probably. But what fun would it be to admit to that? So instead, we get into the story of how much this father loves his children and just knew that they really needed their milk for their cereal. I don't want to just narrate the story for you because it is very entertaining and it's really cute, but the story that he spins involves pirates and hot air balloon, which let me actually say this correctly because it is not a hot air balloon. It is in fact a floaty ball person carrier. Piloted by a super genius stegosaurus called Professor Steg. Who is a girl. Professor Steg is the world's greatest genius who ever lived, but also not so great at naming things. Okay, she's very, very literal, and I absolutely adore that. I love her names for everything are super literal except for buttons, which are named after her aunt button. In the interest of not ruining the entire book for everybody, I don't want to go into all the details, but I think the best thing to say about this book is that the pacing, while definitely made for children, because it has a, this happened, and then this happened, and then this really weird thing happened, and this happened, and this happened, it's delightful, and it's a really fast read. It's only about 100 pages, and a lot of those pages are full of gorgeous illustrations. So then we've got Professor Steg and her floaty ball person carrier. Which is also a really good moves around in time machine. There's going to be some time traveling shenanigans that are reminiscent of Doctor Who, which is fitting given that Neil Gaiman has written episodes for Doctor Who. You should check them out. If you have not, you should. So throughout the entire story, the dad never once forgets that he has to keep a hold of the milk. He keeps it deep in his pocket, holding it in a hand, always making sure to let whoever he meets know that his children need this milk for their breakfast. You have your milk, and where there is milk, there is hope. 
There are some really delightful little bits here. And anytime you see fortunately, you'll get to discover where the milk was. Or unfortunately, sometimes. Yes. There are a few times where, unfortunately, he's shorn of his milk. Oh, actually, for the first half of the book, Professor Stegg seems to be a he. Interesting. This actually harkens back to how sometimes the people who start telling wild tales, especially the little kids, make things up as they go along. I think there's a little of that here. Having been someone who enjoys telling wild tales to other people's children, I make things up and come back to things, or it has the makings of a tall tale. Just as a quick summary, because seriously, you just need to read this and you need to look at it and it needs to be something that you experience without being told about it. Steg and the dad go from pirate ships to islands with exploding volcanoes. They go forward in time and find talking ponies. They go back in time, possibly back to where they were in the first place or right before and the things that I love, I think, the most out of this is occasionally you'll get that little interruption in the story. Kind of like the Princess Bride. Yeah. Wait a minute. Piranhas. Piranhas are freshwater fish. What are they doing in the ocean? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Piranhas were later. <laughs> And again, the dad is showing the improvisation skills of the best dungeon masters and knowing when to just, okay, hold on, we'll put that somewhere else. <laughs> I'll stick a pin in that. It has some elements of sort of like a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy for kids feel to it, which again is fitting given that Neil Gaiman was close friends with Douglas Adams and actually wrote his biography. Worth a read. Everything by Neil Gaiman is worth a read. What was your first book by Neil Gaiman that you read? My first was Neverwhere. Same here. Actually, no. It was it was Good Omens. Good Omens is kind of half Neil Gaiman, half Terry Pratchett. It definitely, though, has both of them in it. Very much so. You can see the parts that are either one, and it's delightful. So my first one was Neverwhere, and that's because your old roommate gave me the book when I was staying with him and his wife right before I left Spokane. So it's always going to be a good memory for me. It's a good book. As we close down this section of the book, we come to the first instance of losing the milk. He's been so good about keeping a hold of this. And then all of a sudden, the dad and the stegosaurus, in their attempt to avoid getting lava to death, they wind up going forward in time, but the dad has lost the milk. <gasps> Where did he lose the milk? On top of the volcano's head. That's a bad place for milk, and we'll find out what happens next time. So now it's time for us to find our Phrenemos of the Week. Who is our model of practical wisdom that you found? I chose the dad. This book has a lot of characters going from aliens to pirates to wumpires. And it also has the kids. The kids who think that they're smarter than their dad. And the reason I chose the dad is because he is playful. He's being really sweet to his children. Rather than being upset that they automatically assume that he just ran into a friend and wasted a whole bunch of time and made them wait forever to get their milk and they didn't have breakfast and the implications that he is not a good dad. Instead of just <sighs> ungrateful little children, he's like, but wait, this is what happened. And he spins this tale. He improvises or it really happened. This madcap adventure to entertain his kids. He takes the time to comfort his kids and to do things like give them hot chocolate. He makes it seem like he's not paying attention, but he does reassure his wife lovingly, in fact, that yes, he knows what he's doing. And he takes joy and pride in delighting his children. 
I can think of a few people that are friends of ours who act similarly. So that is my Fornemus of this week. All right. And then I have a question for you. Okay. What are your seven words from the book? Oh boy, I had a tough time. There are many, many great little seven word sentences here. So I'm just going to read a bunch of them and then pick one of them. First one is, she did not actually like eating them, which is in reference to a mean little experimental prank that the boy pulled on his sister. He put mushrooms in chocolate without telling her that it was mushrooms in there. And then fed it to her. Right. Sounds like a brotherly thing to do. Also reminds us of a friend of ours who, whenever we have a meal together, and he says, guess the secret ingredient, that secret ingredient is always dried shiitake mushrooms. And it doesn't matter if the dish is sweet or savory or sour or whatever, there's always shiitake mushrooms in there somehow. I think my favorite was the apple pie. Which kind of worked just because they just absorbed all of the sugar and cinnamon flavors and just had kind of a weird rubbery texture. It worked. We've got, she was presenting a paper on lizards because that's a fun little sentence to make. So then uh, you'll let the space-time continuum in. All right, and that is reference to? And that's when he's on the alien spaceship. That's right, there will be some aliens in here. A new kind of mermaid with legs. Okay. Yep. What is that in reference to? That's when he's found by pirates in the ocean. Ah. And then we've got Professor Steg's floaty ball person carrier is the original name. Now you're taking liberties that I am taking advantage of next time with the fact that floaty ball person carrier has a lot of hyphens in it. We're going to treat that as one word for our purposes today because that's just fun to say. What? It's just fun to say. <laughs> for all of our Heroes of the Storm fans. Yep. Another one is, I named it after my Aunt Button. <laughs> and my last one is, where there is milk, there is hope. So that is the official seven words that you want to go with? Yep. Where there is milk, there is hope. I like it. Thank you. And so with that, we come to the end of our little bonus pod. I want to thank you for potting with me. Thank you for potting with me. And thank you for listening to Tales from the Waystone. Next time on Tales from the Waystone, we'll do Fortunately the Milk, Part 2. We would like to extend a huge thank you to Shawnee Jang for our theme music. And many thanks to Neil Gaiman for giving us a silly book to talk about. Audio production and editing, courtesy of me, Phoenix McCullough. Project management and writing, courtesy of me, Will McCullough. If you would like to help support us, please consider becoming a patron on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash waystonepod, where you can get access to show notes, custom digital posters, exclusive Patreon-only bonus pods, and other exciting items. And as always, here's to one more day above the roses. To one more day above the roses. So then uh, we're almost out of milk. That's five words. We're almost out of milk. Well, never mind then. Scratch that. Like forks, only not as stabby. It's another good one. In reference to spoons? Yep. He had his no tea face. That's six. Damn it. Count the other ones. <laughs>